seven o'clock. So um, I will therefore start. And um, it's my great uh, delight to welcome you all back for a new academic year of the um, Cathedral Theology Network. And um, if you haven't uh, taken part in one of these courses before, um, it's uh, the, the premise is very simple. You haven't got any homework to do unless you'd want to do it. And um, it's an uh, opportunity for you to go deeper into your understanding of uh, theology, of history, spirituality. And, um, and uh, this year we've got a range of uh, really exciting courses coming up. Some of them are sort of half developed by speakers. They're not yet up on the website, but uh, do keep checking for uh, things for 2023. But um, before Christmas, we've got um, this wonderful course from uh, Ben on music and worship. And then later in November, a series on the Reformation um, in England. I think it is English Reformations rather than uh, Britain. Um, but it's my great delight to uh, welcome Ben today, Ben Phillips, who is a researcher in music, uh, religion and culture. He's just uh, finished some postgraduate work um, at York University and is um, just about to embark, I hope, uh, he hopes, uh, on um, further research into Welsh uh, Anglican choral foundations, which I imagine is a pretty under-researched area, um, which always sounds, sounds like it to me, <laughs> which is always good if you're thinking about doing a PhD, uh, so that's great. And um, uh, Ben's got a range of um, his own musical experience, which I'm sure he'll talk about, um, and studying music um, and uh, also working for cathedrals um lord have mercy upon him and um it's uh, <laughs> it's great to to have him uh, lead us in this course today and, and certainly what i've seen of, of the course outline looks really fascinating just a bit of housekeeping for the course we don't tend to um, unless ben sort of invites um comments uh i tend to encourage everyone to sort of keep keep muted but if you've got questions as as they emerge or occur to you during the course of the 45 minutes or so um uh do um yes oh, look at that uh, you do have a pencil and notepad ready <laughs> there's, a, there's a strong um year six element to that um but yes have a pencil and notepad ready but um you'll notice that hopefully if you're well accustomed to using zoom that at the bottom there's a little uh, option to click on chat and if you click on that you should see the chat to everyone and you can write your questions there so that's probably the best way to um to proceed, Ben might ask you to elaborate upon that question when it come, the time comes. Um, but um, uh, but in the meantime, um, there's probably not much more for me to say. And uh, just to to welcome welcome you all and let uh, Ben get on with it. Ben, well, a warm welcome to you. Uh, we, we'd all be clapping our hands enthusiastically, but we won't do that because um, it'd be very noisy. Daniel, thank you. It's a privilege to be here with you all this evening, even though virtually. But my first thing to say, of course, is hello, good evening and welcome. Um, I'm delighted you could join us. And so let's just let's just get started. Let's get cracking. In an interview with Douglas Murray, the world's most famous atheist professor, Richard Dawkins, gave an insightful and for some quite a shocking quote. I'm kind of grateful to the Anglican tradition, Dawkins admits, for its benign tolerance. I sort of suspect that many who profess Anglicanism probably don't believe any of it at all in any case, but vaguely enjoy as I do. I suppose I'm a cultural Anglican and I see everything through much the eye, same eyes as I see a village cricket match on the village green. I have a certain love for it. Would he ever go to church? Well, yes, maybe I would. This set of sessions covering music and worship is admittedly a brief, but hopefully enjoyable romp through 800 or so years of music and worship, exploring it through the accepted narrative but also combining it with stories of the characters, both great and small, and the occasional listen to a good tune. By the end of these sessions, I hope you'll have gained a greater appreciation and knowledge of the English slash British choral and liturgical tradition, an understanding of its evolution, its practice and musical and socio-historical context. For many, Anglican choral worship is the bedrock of their personal faith. The biblical canon expounded with rich psalmody, soul enriching anthems, and the canticles of Mary and Simeon, the Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis, being offered on our behalf. 
For others, it will be a service with an extensive corpus of repertoire spanning over a thousand years. I often marvel that it's only in cathedrals that day by day, you can have an anthem from 16th century Italy, plain song psalmody with roots in the Middle Ages, canticles in English written in the last century, concluded with a voluntary written by a German several hundred years before the instrument it is being played on was built, or something that may have been thought up by the organist partway through the intercessions. In what other musical sphere can you experience such a vast range of musical traditions, representing unified European traditions long before a unified Europe, Germany, or even Italy existed? So I make no apologies, but this course treads a fine line as we all come to this with our own preconceptions, knowledges and experiences. But I do hope that you'll take one thing from this course that you didn't know before you started and that you'll be triggered in the best possible way the next time you hear or experience it. So where do we begin? The New Testament is a very handy place to start. Paul, in his epistle to the Ephesians, in the midst of telling them to behave, give up their pagan ways and too much boozing, exhorts the Christians of Ephesia to be filled with the spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But even with comments like this, the early Christians were still unsure. The early fathers of the church were divided in their attitudes towards music. They recognized its emotional and spiritual power, but was this the power for good or for evil? Basil of Caesarea, writing in the fourth century, sums up what I think most would expect from church music, that behind a good tune, a harder message penetrated through. God mingles the sweetness of harmony with the divine truth, so that while we are enjoying the pleasures of hearing the music, we may unconsciously gather up the benefits of the words which are being spoken. This is just what a wise doctor will do when, obliged to give bitter medicine to a sick man, he lines the medicine cup with honey. Contrast this with John Chrysostom. Many of us know him for the prayer said prior to the grace at evening prayer, and for the musical settings of his Eucharistic or divine liturgy, um, as composed by Rachmaninoff, Rimsky, Korsakov, Gretchaninoff, or Tchaikovsky. Thus does the devil stealthily set fire to the city. It is not a matter of running up ladders and using petroleum or pitch or tow. He uses things far more pernicious, lewd sights, base speech, degraded music, and songs full of all kinds of wickedness. He obviously foresaw some of what musicians would get up to about millennia later. So whilst we do have this some, have this some sort of endorsement from Basil, John worries about it being used to enable debauchery, whoring, and general naughtiness. However, the Roman imperial advisor and author Lactantius squares the circle for these theologians. Nothing will delight your sight except what you see to be essentially good and right. Nothing will please your ears, but what nourishes your soul and tends to your improvement. So if it is pleasure to hear music, let your best pleasure be to sing and hear the praises of God. In his Confessions, Augustine of Hippo poses a critical question, one that I don't think will ever be fully able to answer. He agrees that music and worship up to a point is a good thing, but beyond that point, it is a bad thing. But where is that point? And is that point always in the same place? So this seems a good place for me then to define what we are mostly dealing with in these sessions, the music and worship of our cathedrals the recitation or performance of the daily offices and the mass where the core of cathedrals and major monastic churches up to the Reformation. Post-Reformation and post-Restoration, this becomes again the core of a cathedral's life, its very essence. Whilst we can kid ourselves that it being the bishop's church or mother church of the diocese is the reason, the reality is that cathedrals have always been better resourced in terms of manpower, finance and education. 
Late in this course, we'll follow the journey of one family from their home in Cornwall to the far west of Wales onto Gloucester before fragmenting to a number of foundations, Chapel Royal, King's College Cambridge, and even Worcester Cathedral twice. This is, of course, the family Tom Tompkins, who we'll have a look at in a couple of weeks. While some parishes had pull, the majority didn't. But rather than dismiss it, as many in past years have, we acknowledge the separation of traditions. There is much overlap. There have been periods where some parish churches have performed significantly better than their cathedral counterparts. But even then, there is a genuine difference that we should quickly explore. So how do we define the cathedral music and worship tradition? Kenneth Long, in his comprehensive music of the English church, defined it as essentially one of delegation Music is offered on behalf of the people by a highly trained choir of which the men, back row, are usually professional standard musicians and the choruses have been given a thorough and lengthy musical education. Having read over Long's definitions, I've refined them slightly to reflect the half century since publication of the book. So let's have a look at our definitions up close. Cathedrals offer sung worship on behalf of the congregation. It is a spectator sport. Whether three or 300, the worship goes on exactly the same. At least two full choral services are sung on Sunday. Even song is sung on multiple occasions during the week. The repertoire represents a millennia of music, representing a wide corpus from plain song to modern Western art compositional styles, requiring versatility in performance practice. Psalms are performed according to either those of the day from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer or a weighty selection from the lectionary. Psalmody is performed akin to a ping pong. One verse sung by one side, the other verse by the other. Two sides, the canai for dean and cantoris for chanter, are used to offer antiphony not only in psalmody, but in other things such as the verse anthems and verse services, which were in vogue during the Reformation era. Anthems following the third collect at morning and evening prayer are nigh on obligatory. These show most versatility in composition, richness of textual choice, and can often be seen as the tour de force of a service. Many cathedrals save their weighty works for the weekend or for principal holy days. And in parish churches, the concept of the choir in a parish is different to one in a cathedral. The parish choir lead the people in offering sung worship. Parts of the Sunday liturgy, which would exclusively be reserved to the choir in a cathedral, is shared with the congregation. This may be the singing of glory in excelsis or sanctus at mass, the responses, psalmody, or even canticles at evening prayer, many now having sadly dispensed with the singing of morning prayer. Hymnody prevails, more hymns, less anthems there's compromise. Cathedrals expect, nay demand, a fully sung service. The congregation are spectators, but in parishes they are participants. The late 19th and early 20th centuries saw the evolution through the liturgical movement of the whole people of God being participants, and this is best reflected in the parish compromise. As described before, the glory at mass might be congregational, whilst Kyrie or Agnes may be performed by the choir alone. At even song, this will be demonstrated through the singing of canticles or psalmody to Anglican chant by all and an anthem being replaced by a hymn. Long extemporized on ideas of repertoire separation, but I don't believe that that's, there is a distinct corpus of parish music, save only for certain snobbery. There are places we could all name that blur this line. Cathedrals where the interpersonal dynamics and inherited tradition mean that a more parish type of worship has to be offered, particularly the Eucharist. Then again, a number of parish churches can also rival, if not better, many cathedrals in their musical and liturgical offering. So as we prepare to dip our toes into the timeline, let's quickly recap. The music and worship of Anglican churches is part of our wider cultural and national life. 
if even Richard Dawkins comes out in favour, then we know that we're on to something. It's a big topic. We're going to dip our toe along the way in many different aspects and gain a greater understanding and knowledge of a complex living tradition. We've learned that music has always had a place in Christian worship. The early church fathers weren't united on their views, but the commonly held view was that it was a good thing and a means to an end. We acknowledge that, in England at least, there has been an active divide between cathedral and parish style worship and music. We're also aware that it isn't a fortified divide, but one where much lies in the gray areas. So let's jump into our time machine and go back before the internet, before television and wireless, even before the printing press. Travel was arduous. Communications took months, if not years, and the church occupied a central position as educator, oppressor, and liberator. Of course, this period is termed the Middle Ages, and it is here in this age of innovation, but also a squalor, that we take our first dip into music and worship. The early musos amongst us may be disappointed that I'm not indulging too much into the music of the period. Part of it is because, like that many others cover it with honey and ooze far more fabulously than I ever could. But also, we're only taking a dip into all this here, so you get a bit of an idea of what comes next. A setting of the scene, if you will. Panic not, I've got a few little snippets in here, and hopefully some recommended listening available later. The cathedrals, this is the golden age, both in power, in spiritual and secular terms, and finances are at their height. Cathedrals are at the beating heart of their local and regional economy in terms of both soft and hard power. Centers of academic and practical learning through their schools of vocation formation. Their libraries are developing with books written and even illustrated on site. The cathedral leadership are interwoven with regional and national leadership. If you thought the parental familial links helping you into a good job were at an all-time high right now, then you'd be horrified by the nepotistic incest that took place in this period. What we've, whilst we've defined differences between cathedrals and parish churches earlier, I'm going to try and fit everything into that bracket as far as possible. We see at the Southern Middle Ages the beginnings of grey areas, that area in between where church institutions are neither one nor the other. So what are these grey areas and how do we get them to fit into a binary understanding? So we have an understanding of what a cathedral is and what a parish church is. Cathedrals can be divided into two camps in this period. Monastic, staffed by clergy and laity of religious orders, and there's a little list of those or secular, and on the right, again, another list of those. The secular cathedrals contain non-monastic clergy and share a number of similarities with collegiate churches. The difference between collegiate churches and cathedrals are that cathedrals are the seat of a bishop and function as mother church of a diocese. Whereas a collegiate church may be stuffed similarly, it is without the diocesan function of a cathedral. Other than the lack of a bishop on regular occasion and the diocesan remit, there aren't huge differences in terms of staffing between cathedrals and collegiate churches. Indeed, a number actually serve as cathedrals and can be seen in our list, but many too serve as parish churches and some exist purely in and for themselves. For example, Brecon. We see endowed educational establishments. The famous ones, King's, Cambridge, Eton, Winchester, New College, Oxford, being chief amongst the examples. These, of course, provide the men for service in the higher echelons of church and state. There's also the link between medicine hospice and church with hospitals. St. Mary in the Newark, Leicester being a chief example. We've also got chantries with collegiate establishments. St. William's College in York is the most famous example as is St. Mary's College in St. David's. Indeed, these colleges could often be found supporting the musical foundation of its nearby cathedral, as was seen in both in St. David's and in York. 
We also see other secular institutions requiring a retinue of clergy and music. The most famous and indeed only one now in existence is the Chapel's Royal. All of these foundations would have had what we would term a choir and had a worship schedule that would make all but the most faithful clergy and laity of the present day shriek. But before looking at the music and liturgy, let's take a quick look at our surroundings. John Harper, in his Forms and Order of Western Liturgy from the 10th to 18th century, provides a superb image of how the architecture supported the music and worshipping life. So what we see here is very little change from what we may encounter today. From above, we see the choir split in two based on the Decani Cantoris ping pong I described earlier. On the front, you get the choristers, the juniors. Behind the clerks, or back row of the choir. Behind them, you get the seniors, the canons. At the far right of our diagram, from above, you see the ordering of the presbytery. The altar with the steps and foot pace, the priest celebrant at the top, the deacon below on the middle step, and the subdeacon on the bottom step. The ordering of both choir and altar remains barely changed in a thousand years. So let's look at the top, at the cutaway of the source. In this example, the decanal abbot or presenter, prior saw at the far west of the choir. At the far end of the choir, we see the lectern, where lessons may be read from, and in the center, the musical apogee, the lectern in medio cori, where the choir book would be placed for the singers to read from. Music has always been an expensive outlay for cathedrals, and in the Middle Ages, this was no different. Whereas now we have individual copies of works, back then, and right until the invention of mass printing, choir books formed the corpus of performing editions for works. These books are huge, and they need to be, as the entire choir would gather around to read their parts. The trebles at the front, being the smallest, with the other parts gathered around the back. Often, these choir books were lavishly illustrated, demonstrating their importance and the investment shown in producing them. Originally printed on vellum, paper became more popular and less costly. Cathedrals would possess a number of these to reflect a growing body of musical repertoire. So we've talked about the architecture, we talked about what the singers used to read music. But before we get to the meat of it, we need to visit quickly the interplay between choir and clergy, musicians and priests. There were clear rules as to who did what, when and why. At each service, someone was required to begin it. This varied according to the item and according to the importance of the day. At the celebration of the mass, parts were reserved to the celebrant, the priest at the altar, the deacon or the subdeacon. At the recitation of the office, the minister's part was usually taken by the duty cleric, the hebdomadarius. However, if an absolution or blessing was given, the senior priest present would do this. At both mass and the office, the choral chants were begun and the solo section sung by the members of the choir chosen by seniority. Those who were tasked to begin each chant were chosen by the presenter, the cleric in charge of music and worship, at the start of each week. Thus began the ping pong between the two sides of the choir, which continues to this day. You may see on some cathedral music lists specified verse week decani, or in some places at the start of the week, it'll simply read decani or cantoras without further explanation. The number of persons beginning the chant differed depending on the rank of day, from one or two on a normal or ferial day to four or five on principal feasts, such as Christmas. The place from which they sang varied too, and was influenced by local tradition. Some would sing from their places around the choir lectern. However, some would claim the right to sing from one of the stalls, if clergy, or from the other lectern. So we've got our bearings. In our imaginary medieval cathedral, we know our identity and understand that there are differences in types of churches. We know the geography of the performing space, we know what we sang and what from, and we have a fair idea of the internal order and who did what. 
So let's then have a look at what a typical daily cycle looked like in a fully functioning foundation. As far as clergy were concerned, the mass was a foundation on which the elaborate superstructure of services known as the office surrounded, and they began early. We'll see in each of these acts of worship things that are familiar to us. The Lord's Prayer, either at the start or during, canticles, prayers and hymns, which still continue to form the bedrock of what we have today. So the offices of Matins and Lords certainly fall during the night, around 3 a.m. or 5 a.m. respectively, depending on the time of dawn. After dawn, they would say prime, which will often be followed by the morrow mass, what we may term now as a low mass, with one priest celebrating with the server. The office of Tis followed next, and would be followed by the high mass, celebrated with the three sacred ministers. Sext would be said near to midday, often fo directly following the high mass, with none in the mid-afternoon. Vespers would follow around dusk, with Compline at the end of the day. Some places variated how the offices fell in each day to ensure maximum turnout for high mass. Monastic foundations, of course, would include other paraliturgical offices throughout the day as devotions um, were needed. So let's take a quick look at the structure of the offices. Note the little explainer which shows which bits would be chanted and said by who. So we see each office begins with the inv inventory, the opening verse, uh, versicle. Oh God, make speed to save us. Oh Lord, make haste to help us from Psalm 69. At Matins though, we open with, O oh Lord, open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise from Psalm 50. Both of these would be followed immediately by a Gloria Patri. Then would follow a hymn and or psalmody. The offices are rooted in psalmody. A reading or short lesson from scripture, sometimes no more than a sentence, would follow. At the major offices, Matins, Lords, Vespers and Compline, a canticle would follow. At the minor offices, a short series of ver versicles and responses would follow. Each office concluded with a collect, a blessing and a dismissory. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Depending on calendar, Matins would contain, a, contain numerous nocturnes set psalms and readings. Even today, these acts of worship form the bedrock of what came to form Matins and Evensong. We'll see towards the end of this series how Compline returned to the Anglican fold. So we've talked about what they said of the offices, but what did the choir sing? The meet and two veg of the office was Gregorian chant, sometimes referred to as plain chant. Here we see the opening um, invitory, O oh God, come to my aid. Chant is described as monophonic, mono, one, phonic, sound. Whilst the story of Gregory I being the inventor is a nice yarn, the reality is that chant developed in Western and Central Europe in the 9th and 10th centuries. It's a progression and fusion of the Roman chant and um, Galician chant. Its, its dissemination around Europe shows the role of improved communication and transport in effecting change. I could do a whole session on chant. However, I admit that others would do it far better. So if you're looking to learn more, um, then David Hilly's Gregorian chant in the Cambridge Introductions to Music series really is a fab primer for it. If you're wanting something more historically rooted, rather than getting overexcited about the news. The late Dr. Mary Berry of early music, chant fame, and not the baker, um, translation of Daniel Saliner's Gregorian chant, a guide to the history and liturgy, is a must buy. Dr. Berry oversaw the resurrection of modern academic interest in chant, and her legacy is one cherished both by Anglicans and Catholic music and musicians and clergy. So we have the simple chant on screen, Deus in Adjutorum, but let's hear something a bit more florid. Or let's hope we're going to hear something a bit more florid. For one of the anthems to Mary, Salve Regina is one of the most beautiful examples of plain chant. The anthem sung in Benedictine monasteries at the end of Compline 
The text in English, Hail Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy. Hail our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To you we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To you we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, your eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of your womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary. I'm going to try and play this for you now. This may not work, and if it doesn't work, we're going to put it, we're going, we'll make sure that there's a link to it in the handout that will be available not long after the end of the session. Often, Salve was the last thing uttered before monastic communities went to bed. Imagine that, going to bed after that every night. Bliss. Of course, the celebration of the Mass, the Eucharist, is the pinnacle of the liturgical day. By the 11th century, it had become very similar to what we experience today. Although in most cases, the Middle Ages saw a performative action offered for the whole community, which, when attended by laity, was performance rather than for the reception of the sacrament. John Harper rightly observes, it is easiest to understand sung masses as private masses at which the whole community was present. For though there may have been more assisting ministers, the celebration in the sanctuary at the high altar was much as in a private mass. It was separate and distinct from the community in their stalls in choir. We see that linear progression in our charts, but as Harpal notes, what was sung by those in choir did not always coincide with what was said and done in the sanctuary. There were texts which were only audible, only to the celebrating priest, and ceremonies restricted to those in the sanctuary. For instance, at the beginning of Mass, the celebrant and his assisting ministers recited prayers, sensed the altar, and continued to say the texts of Introit and Kyrie, while those in choir sang Introit and Kyrie. Not until the beginning of Gloria in Excelsis, on ferial days at the greeting before the collect, did celebrant and choir coincide. 
Whilst acknowledged as the pinnacle of worship, the mass was much more straightforward than the offices. The ordinary of the mass, Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus, Benedictus, and Agnus Dei remained the same text, albeit being able to be performed in a variety of settings. Most of the changing parts affected the sacred ministers. The introit, the collect, epistle, gospel, the secret, the preface, communion, and post-communion collects are changeable, all of which really fall on the sacred ministers. Again, we're going to try and use technology again to show you a short film, and I do apologize for the quality of filming, but if we do get to run it, you'll see the start of a high mass for Candlemas. The sacred ministers venerate the altar at the start of the mass and what Harper has described above in action. The choir are singing Gaude Gaude Maria by 16th century composer John Shepherd. Whilst the text isn't correct for the introit, in the Sarum rite it is the text, we wait for thy loving kindness of God in the midst of the temple, with the verse from Psalm 48, great is the Lord and highly to be praised in the city of our God, even upon his holy hill. The celebrant will have said this as the choir perform the shepherd. So we're going to quickly just get a taste of that. It's not that one. It'll be this one. I do apologize. We might get to some of the ads. Oh, here we go.
So after the introite and Kyrie, the priest turns to the people and sings, or says, Dominus Vibiscum, the Lord be with you, which the choir respond, Ecum Spiritu Turo, and with thy spirit. The priest prays the collect, a prayer for the day, to which they respond, Amen. The lectio, the epistle follows, a re which is obviously a reading from scripture, which would be read or chanted by the subdeacon. Then came the gradual, a shorter, shortened psalmody. On normal ferial days, the gradual consisted of response, verse, response. On holy days, these would be much more florid and elaborate. Following that, the Alleluia, the church's expression of joy, is sung before the gospel. The custom was and remains to omit it during penitential seasons and to omit it for brevity on ferial days. On holy days, a sequence would be sung. They are a peculiarity of the Middle Ages, and one could say are an early forerunner of a modern hymnody. They're metrical, strophic, and often rhyming in Latin and set syllabically to periodic melodies. So, for instance, in the video we just watched, it was Candlemas. So the serum sequence of Candlemas reads, On this bright day, the festive band gives praise, and in sweet concert calls on Mary's name. Purest of virgins, thou alone divine, queen of the world, salvation's cause thou art. The gate of light and heaven, full of grace. To her was erst the angelic message sent, hail Mary of God's grace forever full. In periods of penitence, the sequence is replaced by a tract, which follows a similar idea, although it's less bouncy and usually bewailing of how just awful we are. And so we get to the gospel, which would be chanted. The deacon would sing the gospel, announcing it with a salutation and telling us where it was from, to which the choir would chant in, Gloria tibi Domine, glory to you, Lord. Immediately following was the creed, the, the credo, the Nicene Creed. In the sermon right, there was only one melody. The celebrant intoned, credo in unum Deo, I believe in one God. Following the creed, we get the offertory. The portion of text used, again, is a truncated psalm, like at the introit and later at the communion. At Candlemas, the text used is a verse from Psalm 45. Full of grace of thy lips, for God hath blessed thee forever. The secret, a prayer said over the oblations, is said, naturally, secretly. The conclusion, however, is sung. The secret for Candlemas would be said, Grant we beseech thee, almighty God, that as on this day the gifts are consecrated by the adorable oblation of thy son, so at the prayers of his glorious mother the brightness of everlasting light may be bestowed upon us, but then would be sung audibly by the priest, through the same Christ our Lord, Amen, leading us straight into the Sursum Coda. The dialogue between priest and choir here, lift up your hearts, we lift them up unto the Lord, let us give thanks unto the Lord our God, it is right to give our thanks and praise, are not only sung by the choir, but are sung by all present. This leads into the preface, again seasonal, and addresses the celebration being offered. This culminates with that great hymn of praise, the Sanctus, holy, one of the oldest core texts in the Mass. At a very early date, the Benedictus Qui Venit was appended onto the Sanctus. However, by the late 15th century, there are reported instance, instances of Benedictus being replaced with a polyphonic motet for the elevation during the Eucharistic canon. So the canon, the prayer of consecration, the, where the bread and wine are, of course, consecrated. It's a long prayer. For those of us accustomed to the Church of England's Eucharistic prayers of the last 30, 40 years, it really is a belter. Of course, the priest says it silently and begins immediately after he has finished saying Sanctus et Benedictus. The musical amongst you will wonder why Viennese mass, mass settings have absurdly long settings for Sanctus et Benedictus. It was to cover the priest saying the canon. There isn't a definitive reason for the canon being said silently. Different reasons are proposed to explain why, from the 7th century, beginning in Gaul, priests in the West 
came to pray the Roman canon inaudibly for all but themselves. By the late 18, by the late 800s, I beg your pardon, it came to be considered too holy to be heard by the people and was prayed in a low voice. There's another school of thought who believe that it comes down to practicality. The priest facing east, having to shout very loudly in a Roman basilica, may still struggle to be heard. By saying it sotto voce, the priest isn't concerned with performing it so that the faithful can hear. J. A. Jungmann, the Czech theologian and liturgist, referred to the canon as a loosely arranged succession of oblations. He was correct. For Anglicans, the Roman canon, as it's now called, is a collection of prayers, separate prayers and intercessions, which is why the eagle-eyed amongst you will have noticed that we haven't prayed for anyone. But boy, we're about to. So let's skim each section quickly. So we begin at the beginning, Te Igito, we begin with a plea to God for the acceptance of the gifts offered on the altar. The tone of this and the next few prayers reflect the Christian understanding of divine transcendence and freedom. Enrico Mazza, who's professor of liturgical history at uh, Universite Cattolica del Sacro Core in Milan, reflects on this. The Christian anaphora is to be interpreted not as naive anthropomorphism, but an affirmation of the supreme greatness of God. This prayer also remembers the Pope by name, the local bishop also by name, and the monarch by name and in that order. Then we get to the memento. Here we begin with the proper praying, or rather the priest on our behalf, prays for those present under their care and for the living who they are bidden to pray for. It's interesting to note the addition of individual intentions, which can be the bane of intercessions in church, actually were formalized here. This is why you'll find yourselves praying for Tottenham to win their next game, for Trevor the Sheep, or as one colleague of mine once had to, for each individual member of a children's television program. If you ever wanted to know how it happened, the memento, remember. Communicantes. This is the moment where the priest asks the prayers of the saints. Beginning with Blessed Mary the Virgin and going through a whole waft of them, apostles and the first 12 martyrs of the early Church of Rome. Paul Joseph, earthly papa of Jesus, only got added by John the 23rd in 1962, so he doesn't get a look in during the Middle Ages. On a number of occasions th through the year, though, the communicantus was altered slightly to reflect the celebration of the day. So, for instance, on Candlemas, it began in communion with and celebrating the most holy day in which the immaculate virginity of Blessed Mary brought forth a savior for this world and reverencing goes on with the rest of the list. Now we move on to Heik Ignito and Quam Ablationem. Now we remember what was put on the altar of the offertory. Priests ask God to accept the offering, to give us a peaceful life, to deliver us from eternal damnation and to be counted among the faithful, then asks for it to become the body and blood of Christ. Qui pridi simil modo. This is the commemoration of the Last Supper, and the words of institution, the words Jesus is recorded as saying at that point are used. At the end of qui pridi, the bread is elevated. Likewise, at the end of simil modo, the chalice containing wine is elevated. There's a wonderful story of a small boy shouting at a priest, offering a feeble elevation at this point. Heave higher, sir priest! This would be the high point of devotion and the visible symbol that what had been mere bread and wine had now transformed into heavenly species. Whilst we're not going to argue for or against that here, it's clear that this was the defining public moment of the Roman canon. If you, were th if you thought you were done there, we're, about, we're still about halfway through it. What we see in Under Ed Memores is an anamensis, a solemn recalling that what the priest has just done did happen, recalling to Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension. Supraque and supliches tirogamus, apologies for the really bad Latin there, are believed to have formed a single prayer in the disacraments of Ambrose of Milan, where the Old Testament priests are recalled. Supliches remains controversial to some, as given that Western Christianity now demands an epiclesis, an evocation of the Holy Spirit upon the oblations, 
this comes up with the 1662 Book of Common Prayer, Eucharistic Canon later. This canon sort of does it by asking the holy angels to take it to God and to bring it back. We remembered the living earlier. Now, in Memento Etiam, we remember the dead, asking that all who've gone before us with a sign of peace may sleep the sleep of peace, and that they may find a place of light and refreshment. Nobis quo que peccatoribus is unique, as other than the conclusion of the prayer, these three words are the only ones which are spoken aloud to us sinners also. It's a sort of cue for everyone that it's almost done. The priest asking that the faithful may hope to join the apostles and first century Roman martyrs, even though we have done naughty things for which we are very sorry. For those who take note of such things, the list of saints here includes John the Baptist, then several male and several female saints. Maybe a bit far to talk of equality, but women other than Mary are remembered. Perquem Hegomnia is a penultimate prayer. Through you, Lord, who does always create, sanctify, vivify, bless and bestow upon us all these good things. It concludes with the priest singing Per Ipsum, which ends the prayer giving all honour and glory through Christ to God the Father Almighty and the unity of the Holy Spirit, with everyone responding, Amen. After the priest has genuflected, he intones the Lord's Prayer, which he sang alone. The choir joined at, but deliver us from evil. The priest continuing with a prayer for peace, with all again joining in, Amen. The priest then sings, Pax Domini, the peace of the Lord be always with you. Those in choir responded, and with thy spirit. While intoning Pax, the priest made the sign of the cross three times over the chalice. Unlike now, it wasn't a hug a thon greeting of the assembly. The Agnus Dei follows. A Syrian custom of a chant addressed to the Lamb of God was introduced into the Roman Rite Mass by Sergius I. It forms part of longer litanies, see the Roman Litany of the Saints, or even the conclusion of the Anglican Litany in the prayer book. Three invocations concluding, have mercy on us. Sorry, two invocations concluding have mercy on us. Final one, grant us peace, having become the norm. That was not meant to happen then, apologies. And then we get to the communion. Here we have both the communion chant and the communion itself. The communion chant isn't usually no more than a sentence. The prescribed one of the candle must taken from Luke 2. It was revealed unto Simeon by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The reason for the brevity, at most masses, only the priest communicated. Others would, either at the end of mass or, on most occasions, not at all. This was reasonably normal in Western Christendom prior to the Reformation. And so we get to the end. We're at the end of mass. The priest greets the people, Dominus Vibiscum, then prays the post-communion collect, the prayer for the day. For candle mass, this asks Christ through the intercession of his mother, that the sacrament received might strengthen and mend our lives so that they may be we may be found ready for the world to come deacon would sing eat misa es go in peace the, the choir responding deo gracias please please then may give a blessing so as you've probably already seen and as we conclude let's take a look at how the worship and the music fit together as you see from the diagram on the screen John Harper's observation about it being a private mass with spectators is correct. However you dress it up, ministers at the altar and the choir in choir coincide at points, but outside of that, there is an organic separation. So that's about it. That's the worship and some music of the pre-Reformation period. Some of you will be thinking I've not covered much musically, and there's a good reason for that. Much of the music for this period is practical and now rather specialised. Quite a bit survived what happens next, but is often quite fragmentary. So rather than having something complete, we often have to make do with reconstructions. There are some fab recordings of bits from the Eton Choir book and other stuff from the period out there. Uh, do go and look at um, YouTube and wherever you download your music or stream music. Um, those will all send you 
to hear the snippets as they've been recreated. I'm hoping after this that I'll be able to share with you a resource list um, which has a few snippets on there that will point you point ahead and I'll try and make next week's available to you um, in good time before next week's um, session so that you can get so that the eager beavers amongst you can get a head start. I think we've come to the end, so I'm going to stop talking for a little while and listen to some of your questions. That's um, thank you so much, Ben. That's that's fabulous. Um, I learned lots. Clearly, having been a bit too sleepy in my own history, uh, lectures as a as an audience man, <laughs> so it's a good recap. Um, just looking at some of the comments uh, in the chat section. Um, if you've answered that one, uh, oh. But it's a beginner's explanation about or oh, what an introit is. Like gradual, I might be some of that yeah. language. Yeah, and I apologize. I th there, there's you know a moment of me putting cup before the horse. So the seasonal bits in the in the mass, the introit, the gradual, the offertory sentence, the community sentence, they're all going to be little snippets of scripture. Um, and I, I apologize, I should have put the little introit. I think I did kind of hint at it that it was the verse from Psalm 48, great is the Lord and highly to be praised. Um, but these bits, if you look at any Roman, modern Roman Missal now, you'll see, um, although they'll be referred to as entrance antiphon or, you know, communion antiphon, they still have to be read by the priest and they will be specific to the mass of, of the day or of being offered rather than the generic text that is always said. questions not sure what the reference to the canadian presbyterians from elizabeth and ottawa <laughs> I'm not sure you're referring to <laughs> i think i think i think quite I, different I, from the canadian Pres presbyterians i'm guessing but we'll probably I, come on to the presbyterians later <laughs> um i, I will t i do touch on it not not as much as not I not should, not so yeah <laughs> if people would like to kind of um unmute themselves to ask a question do feel free to do so yeah please do Uh, hello, hello, Ben. Can you can you hear me? Is it? I can. It's it's just a, a simple question, really, and just for a bit of background. Um, clearly, it's wonderful to see the the the, um, the actual worship space, liturgical space shown, uh, and also the distinction between um, what's what's happening with the with the clergy and the laity. Can you say a little bit more about the background to that, and and why the laity were in a sense excluded to the extent that they were? I wouldn't say they're excluded. Um, I, I think it's a very di it's a, it's one of those things where we have to look at it in a different time. It's for for the British amongst us. It's like looking at back now, uh, Carry On movies or Victoriana and all that stuff. Um, but one of the main reasons was, you know, um, the people offering the worship were often the most the most educated and i'm not meaning kind of in a philosophical way i'm talking about they could read and write you know that was you know especially at the start of the middle ages that was not a common occurrence so being so you know you trying to get them to be able to learn you know i to read i believe in one god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth would have been impossible as would have of course being able to provide the congregations with that so it was all very much a, being offered on their behalf um, because of the circumstances. And that's something that's carried over to the English cathedral tradition, um, which, you know, we'll come on to in a couple of weeks time is, you know, this, this very kind of grating post liturgical um, movement of it being offered on behalf of or being a part of and that's something that still i think we in the church of england and in the anglican churches which still kind of are nourished by um what came out of the 19th and, and 20th centuries are struggling to really articulate a question there from lucinda 
whether you could see what, what musical training did the choirs have and were they effectively full-time musicians, which I'm guessing is probably in the, the secular foundations in particular. Right? Yeah, in, in the secular foundations, lots of them would have been um, on staff. Um, so the, um, if they had kids, um, boys obviously naturally for that period, um, they would have been, um, they'd have been educated inside, you know, you, 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 they, it, was, it was a through progression of, you know, of, you know, chorister, novice, holy orders, or chorister, skill trade, musician. There was a, there was a very much through trade, even for, um, even actually post-Reformation, we'll see that at the Chapel Royal, um, where, um, you know, the children of the front row end up going to the back row. Sometimes they get ordained, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they become musicians, sometimes they go on to do other things, but it is kind of it is you know this nepotistic cycle continues. Um, but yes, with the um, but that's a little aside really. But getting back to the crux of it, yeah, they were full time because they would have had to have been singing you know offices morning, noon, and night. So they you know groups of them or all of them would have been out to do everything. In fact, in uh, Lucinda, I think in that Chichester, is. that's uh, that's where uh, Vickers Close is where they all would have lived. Uh, you know, really, um, I think even the house I'm currently living in in the 15th, 16th century you would have had a, a range of priest vicars who had, had who were there to sort of sing the, the masses um, mm. on behalf of uh, of the dignitaries like the chancellor who was too busy reading books. Those are the days. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> all right. Good. And we'll any, we'll do we have any more? Do we have any more takers, or we have we covered everyone? Have time for one more. It's got a burning question. Okay. Well, we have reached eight o'clock. So I saw, um, it, it, I'm sure Ben will be very glad to receive um, questions by by email to, um, uh, or save them up for next week. There's quite a lot to take in there. But um, it was a great overview of um, uh, a period about which um, we generally know. Fairly little, I guess. Um, so, uh, Ben, a huge thanks. And just remind us what you're, we're doing next week. So next week we're going to we're going to start the the exciting bits. We're going to make our little pilgrimage through um, the early Reformation. We're not going to cut. We're not going to cover it all, you know, in one. Um, so it's going to be over two weeks that we look at the um, at the pre-Reformation period, um, and then look at the first post at the post reformation period in england and touch on the golden age of elizabeth and Most and what comes next you. yeah it's um yeah um it, it makes more sense in context <laughs> excellent good well it's fabulous to, to see everyone um you can all go and have your gins now if you haven't had one already and um, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week and thanks again ben brilliant thank you all look forward to seeing you all next week Thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank, you. Really thank, you. thank you thank you thank you very much good night thanks very much good night bye, -bye.